uh, favorable fashion. But it comes with a set of responsibilities, ladies and gentlemen. It comes with a set of obligations. And today we're going to be talking about what those obligations are. Because if you're not aware of them, or if you are aware of them and explicitly violate them, you can easily get bugs that are very hard to diagnose within your systems. Okay? So we're going to be talking about this Liskov substitution principle as the principle to guide us in how we can safely subtype within our, within our object-oriented program, whether it's in Java, whether it's in languages like C Sharp, Scala, Ruby, etc. Okay, so the Liskov substitution principle is going to be our key for recognizing what's a legitimate subtype relationship. If we're making one class a, a sub type of another, perhaps through some classing, and we're going to be emphasizing that distinction in another lecture or two, um, we can apply the Liskov substitution principle to find out if we are um, potentially going to be introducing a, a bug in the way we're, we're using the subtype. Okay? Because it's all too easy to, to create things that look like subtypes, that Java treats as subtypes, the program will compile just fine. It, will, it may seem to run just fine in many cases, but in some cases, it'll crash. Okay. So the general principle that we're going to be harking back to was stated by Liskov and Wang in, in uh, the early 1990s. And, and they argued, OK, um, if we have a uh, type T and we have some property that we're counting on about T. Maybe the property is that T is immutable. Maybe the property is that um, uh, the uh, value of return by a certain method only rises for, for this uh, super type T. Maybe the property is something that it can never be negative, that it's not negative. Then if we create a subtype of T, we need to be able to maintain that property. That property needs to hold for all instances of that subtype as well. Now, this may seem kind of prosaic. It may seem overly formal. But it turns out that it's extremely practical. And it's perhaps most, most uh, exceptional in its importance in that it can save yourself a lot of trouble debugging programs. There's a lot of developers out there some of them from very large corporations who have violated this principle to the cost of development effort, wasted development time, wasted debugging time for a lot of individuals. So we, we violate this or we're ignorant of it at our peril. So the intuition here is quite simple, though, and I'd like to appeal to it. We're going to appeal to it by referring to cases of development time activity, and we're going to be referring, we're going to be appealing to it in a common sense, practical case that uh, I'll analogize to this. So consider a situation in which a developer is creating code with a variable whose apparent type is T1, let's call it collection. They, they think this is a collection. And its actual type is some subtype of collection. It's some class that implements collection, either directly or because it implements uh, an interface which itself uh, is a subtype of collection like set. Okay? So we have, we have this apparent type, say collection, and we have an actual type, an actual class associated with this that's some particular class they've created. So in order to make sure that code, which makes use of a collection, doesn't have to change for each new subclass, indeed, each new subtype of collection, <coughs> we need to have a guarantee in place that if we have a subtype of collection, that we can count on certain properties being maintained that are that we would read from the description of the collection interface. 
So in other words, if we study the collection interface and we say uh, collection makes these guarantees that it's possible to iterate over it, for example, or it's possible to insert things in it in a certain way, then any subtype which, which claims to be a collection needs to also provide those guarantees. It needs to adhere to those guarantees. It needs to be consistent with those guarantees. Okay? Um, and this is important because we don't want to have to deal with the vagaries of every time, if we write code against collection, that we have to go modify that code every time someone introduces a new subtype, a new, new class that implements uh, collection in its own idiosyncratic way. We don't have, want to have to go back and change this code. Instead, we'd like to be able to reuse this code again and again and again, just like Wei Zhong said, and know that with confidence, whatever subtype is out there is going to be implementing the promises, is going to be consistent with the promises made by, by collection itself. Okay, um, So, this may sound restrictive, and we're going to see many cases, concrete cases, probably uh, late in the lecture, where this uh, principle is violated, where it's an illegitimate subtype. It's very easy to create these. However, it's not just a matter of being picky. It's a matter of being careful. It's a matter of getting yourself in a situation where you're just asking for bugs. Okay? Um, the point is, by reading the subtype interface, by re the supertype interface, excuse me, by reading what a collection does and what it guarantees, someone could come away with certain understanding of what's guaranteed. And if we're claiming to create a class which implements collection, we have to stay true to those to those guarantees. Okay. Um, and if we don't, then we may break someone else's code, which was relying upon those guarantees of collection. So. Why am I talking about this? Why is this important? Doesn't, isn't this second nature that if you implement a collection that you have to behave in a way that's consistent like that? You might think so, and you might be excused for thinking so. But the fact is that there's a huge amount of, of historic misuse of subclassing, and by extension, subtype. And again, that's a distinction we're going to emphasize more in a, in a later lecture. Suffice it to say, when you subclass one class from another, A from B, and you create a, a subclass of another class, of a superclass, you're creating subtype as well. And the problem is that often people abuse subclassing as a way to reuse code. They view it as a mechanical way to get the goodies in that superclass that have already been implemented to avoid the need to redefine a broad set of methods within this, within this new class they're introducing. So, so they kind of get a free ride by saying, hey, my class is a subclass of this other class. They get a lot of things inherited from that superclass, and then they go off their merry way and have their subclass, uh, have their subclass behave in whatever way they, they seek to see fit. And this is a real problem. We see this again and again and again. We see it in some large-scale frameworks. For example, the Microsoft Foundation classes were notorious. This was a technology on which a whole generation of Windows programmers relied. And they were notorious for, for breaking the guarantees. They, they used subclassing predominantly as a way for inheritance. And what that meant is it broke very easily in the presence of polymorphism. You couldn't count on a subclass being compatible in its behavior with a superclass. Okay? Um, we'll also see, though, it's very easy to get these fraudulent subclasses, these, these subtypes that don't, that are not compatible with the superclass, that don't maintain the guarantees of the supertypes. We can get them very easily by overly simplistic reasoning about what thing is is should be a subtype of another. Particularly, there's this old uh, object-oriented programming chestnut that when you reason about subtyping, you think about, is this class, does it have an is a relationship with this other? You know, is a student 
a type of person? So a student is a person, and if so, we make one a subtype of the other. It turns out it's, it's easy to get oneself um, off base and, uh, and to put in place mechanisms that, are, that, are, uh, that lead to fraudulent subclasses if you, if you too naively adhere, uh, adhere to that reasoning. Okay, so we're going to be relying in this lecture and the next very heavily on this notion that I appealed to two lectures ago of <coughs> separating interface from implementation. And the idea here, folks, is that um, when we have an interface that, that we provide for our code, we are providing a contract of sorts. We talked about this two lectures ago. We're providing a contract. That, that contract says, if you give me this, for example, parameters, I will do this for you and you know, uh, return a value of such and such a sort or change the state in certain ways. Okay. So these are contracts. These are promises that are associated with this interface. Collection makes a set of promises. It says, if you give me this information, I will do this for you. And when we use a, a collection, or when we use a, a class that implements some interface, we're often relying on these promises. So when we have an interface, and there's some class that implements an interface, and we use an instance of that class, we count upon the specification, that contract remaining true. If we know a collection behaves in these ways and we have a reference to a collection, we, we know that we can use certain properties of it. We can call certain methods on it. We can iterate over it in a certain way, etc. Um, and so we as a user of an object instance will rely on this contract. We're not the only ones who rely on it. For example, if we want a subtype collection, we'll probably rely on how it behaves some. And if we want to create, and if we have a, um, if we have a class that gets subclass, it turns out that we may have expectations about how that subclass is going to behave in case any of our methods end up calling overridden methods in that subclass. We're going to be relying on those. We're going to get to that point in a couple lectures. So the point is, when we create an instance of a class that, that implements some contract, that implements some interface, we're relying on properties of it to, to use that, that, that object. If we have a collection, we count on properties of that collection. OK? Um, now, I've argued that stating the contract is a best practice. Stating the promises, what do you guarantee, is extremely important. Because absent that, it's not clear what's guaranteed. Someone may be tempted and think they have to go look at the full code. Suppose they have access to the code. Why isn't that the solution? Why isn't looking at the code the solution? Hmm? Suppose it's an open source project. Yeah, sorry. Its intent might be uh, misunderstood, and it also is uh, completely uh, inefficient use of your time. It's, it's a wasteful use of your time. You spend a lot of time trying to tease out this code. You might not understand it perfectly. It might be obscure. So those are important reasons, and I appreciate your articulating. But there's another key reason, folks, that it, I often test in pop quizzes, and I often test in exams. Why is it? Suppose you have a... You go to that code and you perfectly understand what the developer of that code was is doing, and you you now come away with that knowledge and you make use of it when writing code that uses those methods. You know how those methods work, so you use them uh, appropriately. Why does that not get to the root of the issue? There could be like more subtypes for those uh, implementations. That's right. So there could be subtypes of there of that class that we're counting on that implement those methods differently, for example. Well, that's a great example. What's another thing that might happen? 
I think Matthew mentioned actually, and I'll, I'll just point to a change. That code might change, right? I mean, unless you control it, that developer might go off and change that code in the future. They might change any number of different ways. If we're counting on every an arbitrary characteristics of that code, suddenly their change might break our code. We can't just look at their code and expect everything about it to be forever the same. What we want instead is certain promises about what's guaranteed, certain promises about what will be maintained. They can change the other aspects of the code, but as long as those promises are maintained, as long as that statement of what is guaranteed, they can go off and change the algorithm, they can change the internals of the data structures, they can change any number of different things about the code so it's more efficient, it has less memory footprint, it's, uh, it's uh, easier to understand, it's refactored and clearer, it's more general. They can go off and change those things as long as they adhere to that contract. So it's the contract that gives us a sense of what we can count on long term. Going and looking at the code, it might work right now. We might come across with correct working, but who knows when it will break. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking here about this issue of promises. Today's lecture is all about promises. Okay. And in another lecture or two, we're going to be talking about the fact that we also have to worry about implementations when it comes to subclassing. Okay, subclassing in addition to subtyping brings in a lot of a lot of additional issues that need to be thought about. But today it's all about promises. How do we create a subtype that makes promises that are compatible with the promises of the superclass? How do we create a set that makes promises that are compatible with, that are consistent with, that are that are that stay true to, that provide the same guarantees as the promises of the superclass? Okay, that's what today is about. Now, I told you that I wanted to appeal to development, uh, you know, to development scenarios where you're relying on the instance of a class, for example, and you're passing it to a method which, which treats it as if it's a collection, for example. Um, but I also want to appeal to real-world example, and the example I'm going to be using is this franchise this um, franchise service. So we're imagining FedEx, right? Um, so, so we have, we want to set up a FedEx franchise. We want to set it up here in town. And uh, its name, as you expect, was, is going to be FredX, right? So we're going to have FredX. Um, and we're going to be a franchise of FedEx. Now, FedEx has certain rules in place that you can go look up on its website and have certain rules in place for when you have to deliver a package to be delivered by a certain time, say the next day. Certain times you would have to deliver it to uh, FedEx so that they can get it to the destination by midnight the next day to 5 p.m. the next day. And for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to um, get away from the vagaries of, of FedEx's actual promises. We're just gonna imagine that the parent company, FedEx, say, um, requires the customer to drop off a package by noon. And if you drop it off by noon, this is a key constraint, if you drop it off by noon, if you adhere to that precondition, they will guarantee delivery by 5 p.m. the next day. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you drop it off by noon in their offices, they'll get it to its destination anywhere in Canada by 5 p.m. the next day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so what I want you folks to reflect on is what flexibility is there? If you're a FedEx, if you're seeking to be a FedEx franchise and a legitimate franchise, you want to be a legitimate FedEx. You don't want to be a fraudulent FedEx, right? There's certain flexibility you have, and there's certain flexibility you don't have with respect to you, your parent company. In other words, your super type. So you could legitimately accept packages that are come in later than this. You have the flexibility. If, if you can do it, if you're a FedEx franchise and you have some way to guarantee that, that even though people drop it off by 3 p.m., that you'll get it to its destination 
As far as the customer is concerned, that's only a good thing, right? What well, would not be okay, what FedEx would get really upset about, and what customers, more to the point, would get upset about, the clients, the people who are using your service, the analogy being using your object, they might get upset about if, if they came in the door at 11.55, just in time by the FedEx guidelines on the FedEx website to deliver with their package. They think they're just coming in under the wire, and you say, sorry, for our FedEx, we require packages by 9 a.m. Can you understand why someone would be upset with that? Hmm? They counted on the guarantees of the parent company. They counted on the guarantees provided through the FedEx website. And here you have, as your company, just by fiat, said, oh, well, you know, we don't, we're FedEx. We don't. We don't deal with those guarantees. You know, all we have is a bike to bike it over to the airport. And, you know, we need it by 9 a.m. or else it's not going to get there. Um, that's not going to fly. The customers are going to be very unhappy. Do you see that? People, people comfortable with that idea. Whereas you can understand how the customers would be fine if you allowed them to drop it off till 3 p.m., right? Maybe they come in 11.55 and you say, well, hey, no sweat. We allow actually to bring the package by 3 p.m. It's like, wow, wow, you're better than your parent company. FredX is my friend. Um, and they'll friend you on Facebook or whatever, right? <laughs> right? FredX, two thumbs up. Two thumbs and two toes up. So... So here, with preconditions, we have some flexibility in one direction. Do you understand that? We have the flexibility. Customers will be perfectly happy if we loosen the constraint. We loosen the precondition. But they'll be very unhappy if we tighten it. They'll say, you're not a legitimate FedEx for this latter case. I mean, you mean you don't adhere to the FedEx guidelines that 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 you can bring in the package as late as noon? Who are you? You're fraud X. You're you know uh, you're you're a fraud as a franchise. You're not a true FedEx franchise. You're a fraudulent franchise. We're gonna see the same principle applies with using instances of a class. We can loosen the preconditions. We can say, hey, we'll provide a method that handles extra cases beyond what the super type provides. But we have to at least adhere to being able to handle all the things that this, the super type handles. Now, with the post condition, we also can modify it in certain ways. So here, there's some service guarantee. As long as the preconditions are met, as long as someone's bringing it in by noon, what do we guarantee? For the parent company, maybe they guarantee delivery by 5 p.m. the next day. Ladies and gentlemen, tell me by analogy, what thing would it be okay for our, for, if we were want to be super FedEx, or, or FedEx plus plus, or FedEx sharp, or what have you, what, um, what, what would be a legitimate variation to say? Yeah. Instantaneous delivery. Instantaneous delivery, <laughs> beautiful. Um, well, uh, you know, beam me up, Scotty, or something. I'll put the package in there and, and send it over, right, to Ottawa, um, right to the prime minister's office. Um, materialize in front of him. Okay, so uh, so great, instantaneous delivery. We could promise, hey, if we can get it, you know, maybe we have, um, maybe we have, uh, you know, some uh, private plane that we can charter, and we'll, we'll. We'll send this out of the airport um, and and get it to Ottawa by uh, noon the next day or by by 5 p.m. today. The customer is going to be happy. The customer is going to be very unhappy if we say, well, <laughs> delivery is by next year. You know, we're gonna we're gonna drag it in a sledge across Canada, um, and and we're not going to get it there till next year. That's our guarantee. They'll say, you're not a FedEx. You're you're a fraudulent. FedEx, um, get out of town. You know, tear down that sign that says FedEx. You're not adhering to it. And similarly, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of what our methods 
perform, the jobs they do are for preconditionist men. They may allow us for precondition to, to take greater number of, 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 of options. Maybe, maybe for the super type, the method is only allowed to take things that are greater than or equal to zero as a parameter value, or maybe it, it can only take uh, references that are non-null. But for our subtype, we actually allow null values. We'll handle null values. Or we'll handle null values that are less than zero as well as greater than zero. So we have a looser precondition. But our post conditions, ladies and gentlemen, have to be at least as tight. So if we, if the super type says the square root operator will provide a result that lies within, you know, 10 to the minus 6 of the actual square root value. For a post condition, it will be okay if we said it lies within 10 to the minus 9. We make a tighter guarantee. But it would it would not be okay if we said it only lies within 0.1 of the value. They would say, hey, you're not a legitimate, well, okay, Fred X is stretching it there because um, it's not in the square root business, but um, you're not a legitimate sub subtype. You're, 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 you're claiming to be implementing the, sub, the super types promises, but you're not. Okay, so let's, um, let's sort of visualize this in a, in a diagram here. So here we have Fred X, and then we have uh, Fred X, uh, excuse me, Fred X franchise one and, one and two. Um, so we can imagine these, these two franchises, both of which um, came, uh, claim to be uh, legitimate. So here, the precondition is the package is, it must be available by 12 noon. This one allows, uh, adheres to that exact constraint, and that's fine. That's fine. We allow it to be delivered by 12 noon. This one says you can deliver it by 3 p.m. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. No one's going to be rudely surprised, right? No one's going to be shocked. No one's going to come in and say, I'm counting on this being the case that it can be delivered by noon, and now suddenly you're telling it has to be by 9 a.m.? That doesn't cut it, right? Um, no one's going to be rudely surprised if you say by 3 p.m. Um, and similarly, on the post condition, it is legitimate to say that the package is delivered by noon the next day. You're providing an extra level of guarantee. Does that make sense? People comfortable with that? So these are both legitimate sub subtypes. Okay. So we're going to be going through. So that's the general idea here. We're going to be going through three particular sets of conditions that you have to adhere to in a subtype in order to be to remain true to the subtype, OK? Um, in order to, to be a, a true subtype, a behavioral subtype, we use the term. This is about not just whether the compiler accepts it. It's whether it's legitimate, whether it's fra or fraudulent by contrast. Okay? Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, three conditions. The first of the condition has to do with method signatures. Are the methods, are their signatures compatible? It does not mean merely are the signatures the same. It means are they compatible with, are they consistent with in a deeper sense. We'll then go on to discuss the behavior of those methods, not just the signatures, but uh, the behavior, and then other properties that transcend any one, sig any one method that have to do with the subtype as a whole, OK? Um, so when I talk about signatures, what do I mean by a method signature? Anyone? I'm going to talk about a John Hancock. What am I talking about? Good. Return type, parameter types. And actually, in, in a language like Java, there's one more thing besides the return types and the, and the parameter types that's part of a, a method signature. What? Uh, okay, the accessibility, yeah, that's actually a good point. We don't get into that here, but but yes, that's actually a, a very good point. So we could think of accessibility as part of the signature, but there's one other thing that comes out of a method that other than a return type. What is it? Exception. Exception. Okay. So good. So we're going to be um, talking about first compatibility with respect to method signatures, and then we're going to continue on to discuss these behavioral aspects. What I want to highlight here, folks, is that the first of these, you're going to be able to tell just by looking at the 
at the um, the actual .java files and knowing something about the subtype hierarchy. The latter one, the latter two here, by contrast, ladies and gentlemen, to reason about them with any confidence, we need to be reasoning about the promises, the behavioral statements of what it does. And, and that requires specifications. That requires a statement of what something does in English or in a more formal way. Okay? Um, so, so I'm going to introduce a notion here of uh, this notion that types, things like object, or string, or integer, um, they're approximations to values. They, they sort of capture a, a certain set of values. And we're going to refer to one type as equally more restrictive than another type. So T1 is equally more restrictive than another type T2. If every concrete object that uh, can be represented by T1 can be represented by T2, it's equally or more restrictive. So for example, ladies and gentlemen, objects, things that are denoted, values that are denoted by the object type here in Java, objects um, that, that satisfies uh, java.object, are a super type of things that are merely strings, right? Does that make sense? Every string is an object, but not vice versa, right? Not every object. If you give me a hash table, that's not a string, right? If you give me an integer, that's not in and of itself a string. It might be that I could do a two-string operation and get a string, but it's not in and of itself a string. Whereas every string is an object, right? I could treat it as an object. It, it, it turns out that it's a subtype of object, okay? Um, and I say string is more restrictive because it describes a smaller set of things. Does that make sense? It's a, sub, it's a subset, yep. Uh, in this case, it's a proper subset. Um, okay, so let's talk about the signature rule. So we talked earlier about the three things that I'm going to concentrate on for signatures. Number one, parameter type. Number two, return types. Number three, exception. So, super types, if we have a super type and a subtype, the subtypes must have method signatures that are compatible with the super types. They need to be consistent with, they need to be safe with respect to, they need to be, um, they need to, to have a, a compatibility with. And the key principle here is known as contravariance. So there's this whole notion in, in uh, computer science that was first uh, articulated by uh, uh, Luca Cardelli um, in the computer language area, saying that, that parameters are contravariant and return types are covariant. So ladies and gentlemen, fancy words, but let's, let's, um, let's boil it down into concrete cases. So if we have a subtype and we have some method of the subtype that takes a parameter, that parameter can be no more restrictive than those of the supertypes. We can only make it more general. We can only allow for a greater number of things. Think back, ladies and gentlemen. Think back to the case of Fred X, your favorite franchise, right? Man, I should set it up on Facebook. Um, uh, generations of 371 students would give their thumbs up. Um, so um, think back to Fred X, right? With Fred X as a precondition, as a as a um, the rule for when you could deliver a package, you could only be more generous. You could only be allow for additional cases um, than FedEx's rule, or adhere to FedEx's rule exactly. You could say, well, by FedEx rules, it has to be in by 12 noon. So for our franchise, it has to be in by 12 noon. Or you could say, well, we allow it till one because we have this. You know, we have Batman on his bike we'll, that we'll go across the country with it. So we allow it till 1 p.m. to be delivered, right? Um, uh, so here, the parameter types can also, they can be no more restricted. They can't restrict what, what the options are for people passing a value in. Just like with Fred X. You can't restrict the times to a smaller set than what would be legitimate for FedEx, for FedEx as a whole. You can only leave it the same or weaken it, 
Okay, um, you can't can't strengthen. So we have to accommodate all cases allowed by the supertype. Fred X has to accommodate all packages up to noon at least. It may accommodate more. And similarly, uh, a subtype has to be able to accommodate any value that could be passed to a supertype, and then maybe some extra ones. Okay. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, well, you tell me why. Why? Suppose I didn't. Suppose I said, oh, no, I'm going to create a subtype. And, you know, the supertype allows you to pass in any object. And for my subtype, I'm only going to deal with strings. That's all I'm going to deal with. You pass it into my method, which is overriding the supertypes method. And I, I'm going to be unhappy unless it's a string that's given to you. Why can't you, why can't you do that? What, why could that cause problems? Who could that cause problems? For whom could that cause problems? Yes. That's right. So maybe our type is a subtype of collection, and someone's counting on this to adhere to all the properties of collection, and suddenly we're saying, well, my subtype is different. I'm more restrictive. I'm more picky. I'm more choosy about my parameters. I'm not going to handle any old parameter passed on. I'm going to require this extra, um, this take this extra requirement. If you call my method, um, it's going to be unhappy. That could be a real problem because someone could pass one of my objects in as if it's a collection, and suddenly the code relying on the properties of collection would, would would not work, right? It would cause problems because my code would would balk at it, would throw an exception for a case that's allowed by the supertype. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, we're going to see this a little bit more later, but does that does that make sense to people? Okay, good. Good, so let's talk, so that's parameters. So this is notion of contravariance. What I want to emphasize there, folks, it's, it's a bit non-intuitive. If you have one type that's a subtype of another. The subtype parameters for a subtype method that overrides the supertype method, the parameters can only get weaker. The subtype of A is a subtype of B, but if we have a, a function foo in A and B, and foo up here takes in a string in the supertype, now suddenly foo in the subtype can only take, it can't take in a subtype of, it can't require a subtype of string. It can only require something like string or something like object. It can, it can handle all objects, right? Just like your Fed, FedEx franchise can handle things till 3 p.m. Wow, this foo, man, that's a good foo. What would you call it? Foo. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's able to handle all these extra cases that supertype is, but it at least has to handle the cases of the supertype. What I want to draw to your attention is A is a subtype of B, but, but the parameter required by foo in A in the subtype is actually a supertype of the parameter in, um, that's required by the corresponding method. Supertype. Does that make sense? So it's kind of going in opposite of directions. That's why we say contra. It's varying in a different, in the opposite way to the subtyping going on of the surrounding class. It's it's uh, it's uh, the opposite of relationship holds. Okay. So so <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, I, I drew that arrow the wrong way. This is uh, somewhat non-standard. In other words, string is a subtype of object, but a is a subtype. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so now I want to talk about return types. So with return types, ladies and gentlemen, we have a different sort of situation. If foo here has a return type, if foo in A, a subtype, is going to return a value, it needs to be compatible with the values returned up up here in the, in the supertype. But it can return a value that's tighter 
than the, than the super tight values. That, it, that provides more tight guarantees. So maybe the super tight returns, for example, an object. Foo in the super type returns just some object. And foo in the subtype could return a what, for example? Hmm? It could return a, let me count the ways. How many different, give me a class which implements object. Well, integer, right? Or, or, or string, or what have you. I'll just put in string here. So, ladies and gentlemen, the, um, Remember, the idea was with the Fred X, we could provide guarantees that are tighter. We could provide instantaneous delivery. Remember the teleporter? Right? We could guarantee something tighter. We could guarantee something more specific, something more restrictive than what's guaranteed by FedEx. That's okay, as long as it lies within the possibilities that FedEx allows. They say It'll be provided there by 5 p.m. They don't promise exactly when. It could be instantaneous, right? Or we could provide guarantee by delivery that day by 5 p.m. because of our fat cycle or whatever that, that heads across to Ottawa. Um, you might have a problem crossing security into Parliament, but um, but he could, he could uh, go across the country uh, lickety-split. And as a result, we could provide a guaranteed delivery time that would be tighter for our FredEx than FedEx. That's okay, right? Do you understand that? Do you understand why a customer will be okay with that? They'd say, man, yeah. Well, if that's what you do, man, let me see the bite too. Um, and, and they'd be happy with it, right? Um, it's What we can't do is provide a guarantee for the post condition, for what's returned that's looser. So a super tight, if it returns an object, we have to at least return an object. Well, in this case, it's not a problem. But um, we can't return anything that's not legitimately possibility of being returned for the super type. So we can only strengthen or preserve types here. Um, we can only return things that are equally restrictive or, or tighter. Does that make sense, using this, this diagram here? And similarly, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get to this with the behavioral side. It's all one unity. Um, in terms of what it actually does, it has to be within the possibility or type. Um, uh, in terms of the actual values, for example, the super type might guarantee it lies within 10 to the minus 5, and we return something that's within 10 to the minus 6. It's tighter than that. That would be okay. Okay, for the exceptions, that final uh, element of, of signatures, Subtype method exceptions can only be the same or more restrictive than those of the same supertype exception. We, they need to be compatible with. They have to be legitimate exceptions that could be thrown under the supertype, but they could be um, more, more specific. Um, maybe the supertype throws a runtime exception, and the subtype corresponding method in the subtype throws a, you know, a divide by zero exception something like that, which is an example of a runtime exception. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, if we were to show this with an example, here we have our super type up here, and I, I forgive me for the uh, busy diagram here. I'm trying to throw, uh, show several, uh, several examples here, and this guy is a little bit off of uh, kilter there, so let me um, put it there. Um, so here we have our super type. It has some method process that uh, that takes a string and returns a string and it throws some exception one. So one legitimate subtype is shown here. This is kind of goes without saying. I could have a subtype of this, say a subclass, right? Subclass is a subtype. It has lots of other things that come with it. It guarantees inheritance of implementation that comes to subclassing, but it is a subtype. Through subclass, and we can pass it around as if it's an instance of a superclass. Super so it is a subtype. And we could have a subtype whose signature is exactly the same as that in the supertype, right? This is perfectly fine. In fact, that's a standard thing in Java. It's very common. It's not enforced in Java. Actually, Java does allow for varying the types for return values. Other languages uh, allow for much more thorough 
changing of the, uh, the subtype to greater than supertype. So Scala, for example, um, uh, if you look at uh, Eiffel, for example, um, there's a uh, there's, they have more flexible rules. And in general, that's the way the world's going. So within your professional careers, you're going to you're going to see a lot of instances of this, but you're also going to see instances like this here. Process in the subtype returns a string, just like the supertype, but it takes as a parameter, it allows a more, a broader set of things. It can handle all objects. And it throws an exception that's a subtype of this exception. That is legitimate. This is compatible with that. Why is it compatible? Can anyone give me a, when I say it's compatible, give me a, a scenario in which it's reassuring that it's compatible. Hmm? Well, if someone, all they know is that it's an instance of my, um, my super type, that's the apparent type. They've written their code against my super type, as way John originally said. If that's what they've done, if they have some code where they're, they take in an argument of type, my super type, and they call process here, and they call the method process on that, on that um, parameter that's been passed in of, of type, my super type. They can call process on any string, and this will still handle it, right? This takes all objects, not just strings, but objects. Question? No. Okay. Okay. Um, similarly, this one returns a string. So if they're counting on this returning a string, this returns a string too. This throws a subtype of exception one. So it throws something that's legitimately an exception one. So this is a legitimate subtype. It varies in its details in terms of what it takes as an argument, what it throws as an exception. But it is legitimate. It's consistent with this. Are people comfortable with that idea? Are you comfortable with that? But these, ladies and gentlemen, are fraudulent. These are the equivalent of fraud X's. For example, something where the subtype has a method called process, which returns an object. Doesn't guarantee that it returns a string. Bad news, folks. Suppose this returns something that's an int instead of a string. Someone can be counting on getting a string back from process, and suddenly they've gotten an arbitrary object. Doesn't compute. In another case, my fraudulent subtype 2 down here in the lower right, we, we have something which throws a different exception. It's not an exception 1. Why could someone be rudely surprised by this? Hmm? Why could someone be rudely surprised by getting something that's an exception 2 when they're using something they think is a my super type? If they try to catch exception yeah, they, they, they think, oh, this is, it's only exception one that can be thrown out. I just have to wrap it in a try, a, a try catch block, and all I have to catch is exception one. That's the only thing that can come out of it. Well, guess what? They're going to be rudely surprised by this exception two. And that's the general mindset, folks. When you see examples like this, and we'll see a bunch of them, um, we, uh, you got to be thinking, how could someone be, could someone be rudely surprised by this? Let's look at my frauds on subtype three. Here, we are more persnickety. We're, we're requiring something that's not a string. We're requiring a double. Actually, it's not just being persnickety. It's, being, it's requiring something that's incompatible with it. This requires a string. This requires a double. So someone could be dealing with something, thinking it's an instance of my supertype, call process on a string, and suddenly be told, doesn't work. You know, um, it, it, it's... Got to, you've got to give me a double, it's, it doesn't compute. So compilers in languages will be able to recognize these things. They'll throw out these, they'll say, um, these are not legit, this is legit, this is legit. Okay? Compilers will do that for you. But guess what, folks? There's a broad set of things. There's a subtle set of things. There's a, there's a uh, potentially malicious set of things. There's a difficult to debug set of things that a compiler is not going to check for you. It's going to be blissfully unaware of it, and it will allow yourself 
to introduce bugs with respect to these latest, these later principles. So method signatures, compliance check, were in great shape. And within your professional, well, within the next several years, you'll probably be increasingly using aspects of flexibility as afforded by these two. Um, and if you get compiler warnings, you'll, you'll look for these sorts of problems. But these next two, it's up to you folks. And it will be for a long time hence. Perhaps in the fullness of time, we'll have ways to deduce more and more cases like this. And we already do have some ways of automatically spotting cases which violate the Liskov substitution principle for certain instances. But in general, the truth is the onus is largely on you. So we're going to be talking about these things. The first principle is the methods of subtypes must behave consistently with those of supertype. And later we're going to be talking about properties that transcend what any one method does. They, they have to do with the properties of the object as a whole, how methods work together to accomplish certain guarantees, properties that are that hold across multiple methods. Okay, so the method behavior rules that the subtype methods must behave like, behave compatibly with, behave uh, consistently with, calls to respective supertype methods. Okay, um, so regardless of whether or not you're going to specify explicitly, you know, uh, using specifications, using um, explicit documentation. If you have a supertype, it can only weaken and maintain or, or maintain preconditions. It must handle at least all the cases handled by the supertype. But it may opt to handle more of them. Hmm? Again, FredX franchise has to handle at least all packages delivered by noon. It might handle all things delivered by 3 p.m. Are you comfortable with that? So this is behavior now. This is not just types path to this is, has to do with for example whether or not you're passing in a null value if the super type handles null values your subtype implementation has to handle null values it can't say well i don't want to handle null values that's not i just don't want to do it um hey if you implement this thing in a super type say collection it says it will handle a null value passed to a given method if you implement that method, you've got to handle the null, the null case. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other hand, if the super type doesn't, if it says um, these properties are guaranteed for all null, 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 non-null values only, and it doesn't say what will happen for null values, you have a choice whether you not you want to implement it. Okay. So you have to weaken or maintain preconditions. By contrast, you have to strengthen or maintain post conditions. So the post condition, after your method is run in the subtype, it needs to be compatible with, at least consistent with, what someone would expect by looking at documentation in the supertype. So again, if you have a square root method in the supertype that guarantees that the value returned lies within 10 to the minus fifth that the actual value of the square root for all integer or for all um, real numbers past greater than or equal to zero, your subtype implementation of that could provide things that are that are guaranteed to be within 10 to the minus 8. They're tighter, right? They're tighter. This is the basic same basic principle we saw in the signature rule. The difference, folks, a big difference is that the compiler's not going to check this for you. You got to check it. The compiler's not going to be able to spot how what level of tolerance is guaranteed. That's up to you. The compiler's not going to spot, oh, he's not handling the null case. That's up to you. It's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, to guarantee these things. Okay? Um, and we argued before that um, that you know this appeals to this real life case. Okay? So it's up to you. It's all on your shoulders. The onus lies on you folks. The responsibility lies on us as software engineers. And it can be a heavy burden. But I want to give you some tips. So you should be looking. Is there any way a user of an apparent class could be rudely surprised by the behavior of the subclass? Is there something the subclass does that would be impossible given the definition of the superclass. 
that someone would say, look, I'm, I'm reading this super class documentation again and again. I can't see how possible you could get a negative value out of this. And a subtype's giving us a negative value. Um, that could cause real problems. They think it's, it should be impossible. There's no way this value could go down. All it has is methods to increment it. And yet, the subtype is violating that, that guarantee. And you have to be very wary of subclassing based on desire for, for code reuse. Um, and I want to emphasize, these concerns come up regardless of whether you have specification um, in place. And so we're going to see that in terms of formal specifications, it can be very handy to explicitly state what you can count on and what you can't count on in terms of, of general properties, OK? Um, uh, in other words, uh, you, you want to state explicitly, OK, this, uh, this value is guaranteed to be greater than or equal to 0, for example, or this value can never decline. That will then mean that those who are counting on the behavior can rely on that with confidence, and those who are creating a subtype know they have to adhere to this. So let's talk about this final category, and then we're going to dive into some examples as time allows here, which it, it, it may have to wait till, uh, till next time. Um, so the final, the final property is the subtype interface must preserve provable properties of the supertype interface that transcend the behavior of any one method. Okay? So for example, there may be certain invariants, certain things that are guaranteed by the set of methods together that you have to adhere to. For example, we talked uh, last time about the importance of value objects, objects that are immutable, that can't be changed, and how we can use them to, go, to very strong effect and with much less hassle, security worries, etc., to build up larger objects. And if you have a super type that you look at its methods, they're guaranteed to never change that object. You need to have a super a subtype that maintains that same immutability. Otherwise, someone could be using it as if it's a super type. All they know is about that super type. They don't know about your class from Adam. It's they, they've never heard of your class. All they know is this is a, an instance of a super type. And by looking at the super type's description, it's clear it can never change. It's immutable. And suddenly, you've implemented a subtype which actually changes it out from under them. They could be shocked. They could be surprised. They could be taken aback. And their, their code could be introduced in a bug because they're counting in their code on it never changing after it's created. Similarly, suppose there's a super type that does not have a delete operation. It only supports inserts. Someone could be excused for thinking, oh, OK, once we've checked that something's in this class as, as, a, as, a, um, as a member of this, uh, this class, that, that there's something in this data structure that's been inserted, that it will always be there. And they can count on that in their code. They don't have to check it again. And suddenly, your subtype deletes, allows for deletes, and now it can be deleted from there, and their code will break. Okay, So some of these properties are invariants that they can count on being true. It's, at any one time, say, it's, greater, it's guaranteed to be greater than zero, or um, it's guaranteed that it's uh, always a perfect square or what have you. They remain true at all times. And then history properties. Maybe. According to the super type, this value can only stay the same or, or rise in value. And that's a history property. It's not something that's true about one point in time. It's comparing two points in time. There is some characteristic that it never declines, for example. Okay? Um, these are things that a user might count on by looking at the super type. And you need to, um, you need to maintain them. So um, with just a... Uh, uh, one minute here, I want to give you some examples and or an example or two, and then we're going to go through a bunch more to make sure you're confident about this. Confident enough to be quizzed on it. Confident enough to be subject to an exam. Okay? So here's our base type. Counter. We have a get that gets the value of that counter and an increment. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a potential subtype of counter. Counter two. 
It provides an increment operation, but increment is defined so that in a different way. This defines increment in an idiosyncratic way, so it doubles the current value. Doesn't increment it by one, it doubles it. Is that a legitimate subtype of this? Hmm? Could someone be rudely surprised? They think they're dealing with one of these. They study this. And secretly they have one of these. Could someone be surprised? Big time. They could say, well, it's supposed to increase by one. and It's doubling it. It's going up from two to four. What's going on? They think it's one of these, and they've actually got one of these. They don't know about your class. They wrote this code against this thing years ago, long before your class was a speck in the cosmic eye. And suddenly, their code is breaking because they say, well, I'm dealing with one of these. How can it go up from two to four by call to increment? And you say, well, we're not FedEx. We're FredEx. We're, we, we do our own little thing here. Um, and, uh, and they say, that doesn't cut it. You're a fraud. That's not a subtype. Here's counter two. Is this a legitimate subtype of counter? Counter, counter four, rather? Mm -hmm. Is that a legitimate subtype? Have a method called double value in addition to all of these? It, it, it implements double value? Sure, that's fine. That's fine. Any value that could be doubled here, you could get back from this. You could have gotten by many increments. So it's not going to yield any wacko values that you couldn't have gotten through this. So someone couldn't be rudely surprised. If they think it's one of these, it's secretly one of these, they won't even know about double value. They're calling these things. It looks fine. Maybe somewhere else in the code, it's going to call double value on it. But it, they could have gotten that value by calling multiple increments. So it's not going to give some weird whacked out value. So this is OK, actually. How about this one? Makes this contain an arbitrary value n? No. Why not? Correct. Um, it's supposed to do mm. nothing, but the contact free requires n. OK, it does require n, but the deeper point is this can be initialized to a negative value, folks. You can never get a negative value. This makes it start at 0. And then it can only increment. This can make it start at an arbitrary negative value. We could get a value that's minus one. And someone could spend their life studying this and say, there's no way we could get a minus one. This isn't, this isn't a counter. How could it be minus one? I can't get a minus one out of this. They might be counting on their code and are always being non-negative, right? Using a, a, the unsigned integer to represent it or whatever. And suddenly they're getting a minus one. Boom, their code blows up. Could that be bad? Could that surprise them? Could that cause them trouble? The answer to all of those I submit to you is yes. OK? Um, and uh, the final one, decrement, if it's positive, could this be legitimate? I'll let you think about that for next time. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that guarantee about it being positive, it's not really like an explicit guarantee. So, but you're still violating the principle? Well, the question is, could someone look at this and come away with a property that they think that they might count on based on this? You're right, that's not explicitly stated. It never says guaranteed to be greater than zero. But someone can be excused for having that, right? If you wanted to provide this, you want to provide flexibility. You might say, no, do not count on this always being greater than zero. You could actually put that in there as a comment. In which case, someone would know. But someone could legitimately, if this is all they see is the documentation, they could legitimately come away with a sense, well, I've got a counter. It's, it's always going to be zero or positive. I mean, how could it be otherwise, given the definition? So if someone could be counting on that in their code that's manipulating counters, and you come along and you say, I want to create a subtype of this guy, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that people may be counting on any property that can be reasonably inferred from this. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, as a matter of defensive programming, even though it doesn't state it explicitly, it is something someone can come away with an impression. They could come away with a very strong um, assurance that it's always going to be zero or higher. And if that isn't disavowed, 
then your subtype to be safe should adhere to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, who knows what code you're passing it into that may be counting on that property, and suddenly it's not the case, and suddenly that code fails with your particular subtype. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that last one then a valid? Okay. So I was leaving to that for, for homework. So here, it, it decrements if it's positive. So it can never go zero. So it's not a problem that it can be negative. Could this cause problems? I just wonder, like, yeah. if you like, yeah. made one, incremented it, and then later you're divided by it because you assume it's not zero because you've incre incremented it. Um, no, exactly. No exactly. Exactly. So, um, so in other words, this could be decreased to zero. You may be dividing by this could be decreased to zero after you've already ensured it's not zero. More fundamentally, this can only rise. It can only remain the same and rise. This can go down now. And so you may be counting on the code that this is going to only stay the same or rise, that it's never going to decrease. And suddenly you get one of these and your code in the code doesn't work. And the point is someone else may have written that code which counted on this long before you created your subtype. They created their code which counts on these effects. And you can't just say, well, I'm Fred X, so we do things differently. Um, you, you have to be aware, okay, what could the customers be counting on? The customers could be counting on the fact that this always is zero or more and that never declines. And so you have to be cautious of the fact there may be code out there which is depending on those things. And it's at your peril that you'll violate that in a, in a subtype unless it explicitly says, you know, do not count from these apparent properties. Okay? Okay. We're going to see quite a few other cases like this next time, and then we're going to be talking about how this differs from subclassing as, as, uh, with the, in terms of uh, some additional issues that come in with subclassing. Okay? Thanks very much.